Hello, and thanks for tuning in for another session of Back Porch Catechetics. In this session, I'd like to reflect on the descent into hell, the resurrection, and the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thinking in particular of the in-brief sections of the Catechism of the Catholic Church that run from paragraphs 636 to 682. When we talk about Jesus' descent into hell, a phrase that we repeat in the Apostles' Creed, we think about something which is sometimes troubling. Why would Jesus go to hell? What does this signify? Typically, we think that Jesus is going to hell to free those who are stuck somehow. Phrases like the bosom of Abraham or sometimes the gates of hell are meant to indicate this place or some sort of meditation on what might be happening here. Usually, all of this is meant to answer a question that arises when we wonder how the Old Testament figures like Moses could be saved by Christ even though they died before the Incarnation. Where did they go? It seems impossible that they could have gone straight to heaven because the gates of heaven were not yet opened. Christ had not come to earth, the Word made flesh, nor had he died, rose, and ascended to heaven. Well, the meditation echoes the line from the Psalms that questions where we could possibly go to escape from God. If God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present, then it seems impossible to imagine a place where God could not find us. And so we have this traditional and ancient sense that after Jesus died, he was taken from the cross, buried in the tomb, and then he descended into hell. There, he somehow offered liberation to those who were unable to get to heaven apart from him. This broad reflection seems to focus on the sense in which Jesus lives the fullness of human experience. The death is real. This is not some seeming death. It's not just as though Jesus appeared to die. Jesus died fully, and in the fully human experience, he saw the terrors of hell. This is taken to be of extreme significance because it means that Jesus offers salvation fully, completely. There is no place on earth or beneath earth that is apart from Jesus' salvation. Nor is there some aspect of humanity that Jesus did not somehow embrace. Jesus was not partially human. He did not somehow only half die. He not only died, but he descended to the depths of death, to the farthest extremes. In this sense, Jesus offers a fully human salvation, but he also offers a salvation what expands to the broadest sense possible. No place on earth, no place under the earth, is left out of his salvation. The resurrection deserves much more attention than any one person could give it. But the key theological point here for the, the study of the Catechism is that Christians understand the resurrection to be a historical reality. Christians do not say this is simply a, a story, as if we made it up, or, it, or it's something we like to believe. It's a hypothesis. Maybe it happened this way. Maybe not. Who knows? No. Christians are making a historical claim. We sometimes forget how radical the claim is of Christianity. We sometimes forget how radical that, that, that the word became flesh is meant to be real. The eternal God enters time. The all-powerful God is born an infant child of a virgin. We forget that the resurrection is part of that cycle, which is unimaginable to us apart from God doing it. This is not explained by any human means at all. We're not speaking in some allegory or metaphor. This is not a fable that we've made up. But Christians actually intend to make the claim that what appears to be impossible 
not only happened thousands of years ago, but that this means that the impossible can happen for us as well. We too can die and then rise to new life again. The ascension, at first blush, appears to be focused exclusively on Jesus. It seems to be an event only in the life of Jesus, and it only affects him. He was on earth, and now he's in heaven. We are tempted to think of it as the Son's return to the Father. The Word became flesh, Jesus left heaven, came to earth for some 30, 33 years, and now he's going back. But this is not simply a return. Because once the Word has become flesh, the whole incarnate Christ, fully human and fully divine, ascends to heaven. The ascension is typically celebrated in keeping with a Jewish sensibility about many feasts and festivals that all run together, the Passover and into the Pentecost. We know that the death of Christ happens on the Passover. He celebrates that Passover meal with his apostles, which we know is the Last Supper, the institution of the Eucharist. The Synoptic Gospels make this clear in a very presentable sort of historical narrative. We see in John's Gospel that Jesus himself is the Paschal Lamb, the one who is sacrificed for the new covenant, which is made in his blood. Well, Passover includes this Feast of Pentecost and a feast that would come 40 days after the resurrection. This is when we celebrate the Ascension. But the Ascension is also connected to the Pentecost of 50 days after the resurrection, 10 days after the Ascension, and that the mystery of the Ascension of the Son is bound to the mystery of the descent of the Spirit at Pentecost. There's something about the Son going up in his humanity and divinity to be seated at the right hand of the Father, which is tied to the going out, the breathing forth of the Spirit at Pentecost. The profession of faith that Jesus will come again for the judgment of the living and the dead is a summation of the fulfillment of all prophecy. In a way, prophets are also always judges. They determine whether God's people are following the covenant. Jesus is the definitive prophet in the sense that he speaks God's word to the present because he is God's word made present to us. Similarly, Jesus is the new covenant because the new covenant is made in his blood. So while the statement, he will come again to judge the living and the dead, is focused on a final and future judgment at which we expect all bodies to rise and be with God in heaven, or perhaps to continue to suffer in hell, this reflection is also a way of collecting all the themes of prophecy and all the themes of covenant into the singular figure of Jesus. We await this day of judgment with hope as Christians, when we hope that God will make us worthy to be fully united with him. Let us turn now to a few senses in which the entirety of salvation history points to the Easter mysteries of the saving death and resurrection of our Lord, when he descended into hell, and then rose, and ascended into heaven. I'd like to share with you an image from a friend, Alison Batley, in her maiden name, when she made this image. She gave it to my wife and I as a wedding present. It's a beautiful meditation. In it, I think we can see Adam and Eve in the womb of creation, when God cast the deep sleep upon the solitary human in order to give us the gift of sexuality, the gift of human community, the ability to give ourselves, to be received by another like us, and to receive another who gives herself to us. Out of that sleep arose the man, Adam, and the woman, Eve. And humanity cried out, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And when the word became flesh, 
all of humanity repeated this phrase. At last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, this one is like me. I can give myself and be received, and I can receive God who gives himself. In the tree, in the garden, we see creation becoming an instrument of suffering and rejection. The cross is a tree in the inverted garden of Golgotha. Well, the new tree is also an instrument of suffering, but it becomes the tree of life that includes all gathered into Christ, all who truly know the good, because we know him who is the way, the truth, and the life. We know the topology of the old Adam and the new Adam quite well. Notice also the topology of Mary as the new Eve. Instead of tempting the man to eat the forbidden fruit, Mary points the way for Christ to arrive at his hour, as John tells us in the wedding at Cana. And Mary remains with him, devastated at the foot of the cross. The old Adam and the old Eve suffered for their transgressions. Mary and Jesus suffer in their own ways for that same original transgression. Just as we see ourselves in the first man and the first woman, we can also see ourselves in Mary as we join her at the foot of the cross and beg for the mercy of her Son, our Lord. The sun and the moon were made present early in the days of creation, and they were present at the crucifixion as well. The sun darkened at the moment of Christ's death, recognizing the deep betrayal at that hour. The waters, too, were present at creation, even before the sun and the moon, and we see them in this image. Noah floated upon the waters of the flood, safe inside the ark, which God had commanded him to make. Moses, too, crossed safely through treacherous waters, the Red Sea. The waters of Noah and the waters of Moses swept away sinful humanity behind them and cleared the path for God's chosen people to form new covenants with him. These waters anticipate the waters of the Jordan and point to the waters of Christian baptism. John tells us, when Christ was pierced in his side after his death, water flowed forth from that side. Blood also flowed from Christ's side, indicating the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, the means by which we join the body of Christ, the means by which we share in this wedding feast of the Lamb, echoing the blood and water of his own birth from Mary and our rebirth as brothers and sisters of Christ who can share somehow as children of Mary in her maternity and children of God in God's paternity as we become adopted sons and daughters of God. The snake in the garden slithers and tempts Eve and then tempts Adam through Eve. Moses too wrestled with a serpent. Only for Moses, the serpent was changed into a staff as a miracle before Pharaoh. And then in the desert, the serpent on the staff became a means for healing the Israelites when they were snake bit. Christ, raised on the staff of the cross, heals us all of the snake bite of sin, restores us from that original temptation with the serpent in the desert and from all of our sins along the way. The Israelites were led by a pillar of cloud and fire through the desert and into the promised land. And what flows from the side of Christ appears also as the smoke and fire of incense rising to heaven among our earthly offerings to God during liturgy, leading the way to the everlasting promised land. And the resurrection, something entirely new and perfectly unimaginable happens. 
And yet, all of salvation history has pointed towards it, perhaps even from the very beginning. <laughs>